माँ हाँ सब याद है ना माँ सब याद है हाँ चलो मैं निकल रही हूँ बाय बाय कुछ चीजों की शुरुआत हमेशा याद रहती है जैसे स्कूल का पहला दिन कपड़े बैग टिफिन सब नया था माँ ने हर बात का ख्याल रखा था गेट पर दो मिनट रुककर मुझको हर हिदायत दोहराई गुड मॉर्निंग मैम से लेकर टिफिन के नैपकिन तक पर मुझे सिर्फ एक बात याद रही मैं पहली बार माँ से अलग हो रही थी मैं गेट की इस तरफ और माँ उस तरफ सिर्फ तीन घंटे की बात है यही कहकर मुझे पहले दिन स्कूल भेजा था पर शायद वो तीन घंटे मुझसे ज्यादा उनके लिए मुश्किल थे वो मेरी स्कूल की शुरुआत थी और आज माँ के स्कूल की शुरुआत है कितना हुआ? 124 हाँ? 120? मैं तो डेढ़ सौ सोच रहा था हाँ? वैसे वन एटी तो बनता है आजकल दो सौ भी कम पड़ता है असली मजा तो दो सौ बीस में लो एक और क्या वन ट्वेंटी फोर थ्री अरे यार खींच देंगे बैटिंग पिच है गूगल ऐप से पूछो और पाओ क्रिकेट की दुनिया के सारे जवाब मैच देखने परसों जा रहे हो ना मैंने बनाई है गूगल आपसे पूछो और पाओ क्रिकेट की दुनिया के सारे जवाब हम छह भाई बहन मम्मी पापा ये सबसे छोटा भाई है अमित बचपन से तो ऐसी प्रॉब्लम नहीं थी इसका पता चला करीब जब तक नाइन्थ हाई स्कूल में आए अब घर में रहते हैं तो थोड़ा अंदाज भी रहता है थोड़ा बाहर जाने पर दिक्कत होती है कुछ नजर नहीं आता है ऐसा लगता है जैसे कुछ है बस वो हर चीज को एंजॉय करना चाहता है लेकिन आंखों की वजह से उसको हमेशा पीछे हटना पड़ता है एक बार पापा मुंबई जा रहे थे घुमाने के लिए तो जितेंद्र से मिलने गए उनके यहाँ उन्होंने इसके कंधे पे हाथ रख के भी फोटो खिंचवाया बड़े खुश हुए सबके फेवरेट हैं बच्चों के तो सुनते भी रहते हैं कि ऐसा चेहरा है पापा से फेस मिलता है जब पापा थे वो उसकी बहुत हेल्प करते थे पढ़ने में लिखने में हर चीज में उसको एक डेढ़ घंटे अपने पास बिठाते थे तीन साल पहले उनकी डेथ हो गई पापा की मैं आपको अकेला महसूस करने लगा हमारी बारात में भी नहीं जा पाए उसको बहुत बुरा लगता है तो नई टेक्निक आ चुकी है 
आप सोचा कि अमित का भी करवा देते हैं अब ऑपरेशन जब कल हो जाएगा तो उसके बाद इन लोगों को सही से देख पाएंगे आगरा भी जाना है ग्वालियर बॉम्बे भी सोच रहा है कोई तकलीफ तो नहीं हो रही बेटा नहीं आपकी पट्टी खोलेंगे अभी ठीक है हाँ लेफ्ट साइड पे अपनी बहन को देखिए हाँ दीदी हाँ पल्स इज मोर बिकॉज ऑफ द एक्साइटमेंट कितने साल बाद बहन को देखा है पंद्रह साल हो गए अब अच्छी तरह पहचान रहा है ना अब तो बुढ़ा नहीं लग रहा मैं नहीं लग रहा हूँ ये ममता की तरफ से तुम्हें हर साल स्वेटर देते थे इस बार कुछ और लाए देखो क्या है पहचान लेगा ये पीहू को और उसको पहचान लोगे देख रहे हाँ हाँ देखो तो देखो बर्थडे वाले देखो तो इसमें है उसकी इसमें है दर्द देखो बता ये बार देखिए दर्श दर्श ये हाँ बता दे लो देखो अब बताओ ये कौन है सेवा कौन है हम्म ये है ये जीतेंगे जीतेंगे याद आ रहा है याद आ रहा है कौन ये समझ में नहीं आ रहा है दीदी दीदी है कोई दीदी बस बस सालों से अपन देखा नहीं किसकी फोटो किसकी देखो
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Mr. Mohit Pandey, Enterprise Country Manager, Google. Good morning, Mumbai. Welcome to Atmosphere India. On behalf of everyone at Google and all our partners, it's my incredible pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you here today. Atmosphere is Google Enterprise's flagship event, and we hold this at multiple places across the world, and we are incredibly excited to come to Mumbai today. We've got a great agenda plan for you today, and hope we are able to inspire and excite you with our vision of a smart, modern, and a secure platform which helps businesses of all kinds and all sizes go beyond legacy, go beyond on-premise, go beyond productivity, and build for the future. We live in interesting times today. We're in the midst of a revolution driven by the internet, the mobile, and the public cloud. Not just consumers, but businesses and enterprises are using this technology shift to really transform themselves and build new disruptive business models. Cloud changes everything. Cloud gives you scale. Cloud gives you reliability uh, and availability at a cost which you've never seen before. Your data is on the cloud, which essentially means that you're able to work on it real time. You're able to build agility in your businesses, and you're able to get a cost advantage for your organization. Cloud enables mobility, cliche, but being able to access your data from anywhere in the world on any device is a really powerful thing. And when your data is on the cloud, you are able to analyze that and use machine learning to get uh, insights from their data which help your business at uh, real-time speeds. Google is a company which was born in the cloud. We have been investing into global-scale infrastructure for the past 15 odd years. We have been working on machine learning and artificial intelligence since 2000. And we are now bringing all of that great technology to our businesses and helping them uh, build their digital uh, journey. The Google Cloud Platform is really the infrastructure and platform as a service offering from Google. You could take advantage of Google's investment into global scale infrastructure networking, and machine learning capabilities to power your own enterprises. We are committed to open standards and open source, and you're going to hear a lot of this in more detail later in some of the sessions today. Google Apps, the collaboration and productivity suite for enterprises from Google. Tools like Gmail for business, Google Docs, Hangouts, calendars, sites, enable small, medium, and very large enterprises across the world to collaborate in real time. Communicate via messages, messaging, text, video, sharing information, searching information, working offline should you need to, and working across any device. Maps. A lot of you probably used Google Maps on your phone to reach this venue today, or at least check the traffic. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't raining today. A lot of enterprises are using Google Maps to power their uh, organizations and build business models with location-based services. So whether you want to build a, a, a service like an Ola or an Uber, or whether you want to track your inventory, or you want to route optimize in case you're a logistics company, Google Maps offers you great solutions for doing the same. Chrome and Android have got a billion users worldwide. And today, organizations, enterprises, businesses are using the power of these devices to transform their own uh, companies. Chromebooks, Chromebox for meetings, Android for work are some of the things which you're going to hear more in detail about today. Just a fun fact, Chrome devices outsold Mac OS for the first time uh, in the first quarter of this year in the US uh, uh, this year. That is the momentum which is building around these devices. Enterprises de use these devices for the simplicity they get, bring in, the security, speed, and, and above all, the cost. 
And all of this is brought to life with our partners. We are incredibly proud of our partner network, both global and local. You see names like PwC, Vodafone, SoftBank, and these companies partner with Google to bring cutting-edge technologies to businesses like yours and help them move on to the uh, digital journey. We are also incredibly proud of our local partner ecosystem. Sears, Team Computers, Shivami, Media Agility, they are all amongst us here today. And they help local businesses in India also transform. In fact, today we are going to hear from Dipankar of PwC on their journey of going Google and how the partnership with Google helps PwC uh, take their clients on the digital journey as well. We're super excited by the growth and adoption we're seeing by enterprise customers across the world and across uh, India as well. We love to see our customers succeed. And there are some great stories which we are going to hear today uh, from some of our customers. You will hear from Piyush, from Flipkart, about, about how Google Apps helped them power away from being a two-person startup to one of the most well-known, when recognized brands, not just in India, but across the globe. We'll also hear from Vijay Sethi of Hero Motor Corp about how the largest two-wheeler manufacturer in the world used the Google platform to really transform themselves and move them to the next stage uh, of their business and become more smart, modern, and secure. Smart, modern, secure, these are some uh, words which you will hear a lot today. Smart really helps you get mundane out of the way. It helps you take uh, helps, you, uh, helps you focus on your job, really working on smart devices, working on the cloud, intuitive interface, and machine learning to help you solve your business problem. Modern. Modern helps you unshackle from legacy, gets you away from licensing complications, helps you consume innovation as and when it happens, not, wearing, not really waiting for the next version upgrade to really come into your way of moving fast. And obviously secure. We are built on the premise of security. You will, uh, you will have a lot of sessions focused deep into how Google not just secures its own infrastructure, but offers that same level of security to the infrastructure which you use on the Google platform. So like I said earlier, we are in the midst of a revolution. India is transforming significantly. The growing internet adoption, smartphone usage, and public cloud is driving the digital revolution in the country. Traditional companies are transforming themselves to, the, to move to the next phase of their growth, and new companies are building new disruptive business models. Yeah. Google is incredibly proud to be a part of this journey in India and partner with businesses to make this happen. And who better than our next speaker to come and talk to you about how India is transforming digitally and how innovation will be the real differentiator for successful enterprises as they move forward. It's my incredible honor and pleasure to welcome Rajan Anandan, Vice President India and Southeast Asia, Google, onto the stage next. Rajan, welcome on the stage. Thank you, Mohit. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to uh, see all of you here. I want to start by thanking all of you for being uh, partners, clients, um, ecosystem uh, shapers, and working with Google uh, and our teams at Google uh, to take really um, unshackle India, which is what uh, really I'm going to talk about. Innovation doesn't need a license. It needs a leader, and that's what I'd like to talk about. I'm going to start off by uh, spending a few minutes on where we are with the internet in India, the big major trends that we see in the internet in India, and also what Google's doing at a broader level, not just from an enterprise standpoint, but from a broader level on, on digitizing India. India today has 350 million internet users. It took 10 years for India to go from 10 million to 100 million users. The journey from 100 to 200 million users took three years. And it only took two years to go from 200 to 300 million users. The fastest ramp in Internet's history. No other country in the history of the world has grown as fast as India when it comes to the Internet. And at the current growth rate, there's no question 
we will have over 600 million Indians on the internet by the year 2020. So it doesn't really matter what business that you're in, whether you're selling cars, whether you're selling cell phones, whether you're selling homes, whether, or whether you're selling pasta. Just about every consumer that you're ever going to sell to is likely to be on the internet by 2020. And for a vast majority of industries, they're already on the internet. And what's exciting about the internet in India is every segment of the internet is growing very, very rapidly. Unprecedented growth in smartphones, unprecedented growth in search, in messaging, in social, in video. What in many ways took 20 to 25 years to happen in the developed markets is happening simultaneously in India. What's exciting to see in India today is how the internet is beginning to impact every industry. In many ways, over the last four or five years, what we've really seen is digital products that have emerged and grown very, very rapidly. But now we are beginning to see physical industries getting impacted, mainstream industries getting impacted. E-commerce didn't exist in India seven years ago. Last year was $10 billion. We'll get to $60 billion in GMV by 2020. Ride-sharing. You know, the idea of ride-sharing didn't exist around the world even five or six years ago. But today, it's very, very interesting to see that the number one and the number two and the number three companies that actually have rental rides or car rides actually don't own any cars. Taken off, in, you know, in an incredible fashion and shaping the entire transportation industry in India. Video entertainment, online video, has crossed 100 million users in India. Young people in India today get their entertainment really from online, right? And that number obviously will accelerate very, very rapidly. And then finally, last week we actually published a joint research with BCG that essentially said the, mo the digital payments ecosystem that is still quite nascent but growing very, very rapidly, driven by companies like FreeCharge, like Paytm, and others will reach $500 billion by the year 2020 and account for 15% of India's GDP. So it's very large, it's growing very rapidly, and it's impacting just about every industry that we know of. As Google, we have a simple mission in India. We want to get a billion Indians online. As I mentioned, the path to 600 million is actually pretty clear now. But to get a billion Indians online, we're going to have to do a huge amount of work, and we're actually working on a number of things. We're working on making the internet more accessible. Right? In a country like India, if you really want to get a billion Indians online, you have to make it affordable. So that's why you'll see Google driving initiatives like high-speed free Wi-Fi in railway stations. We've, set, we've embarked on a path with Railtel to get several hundred stations that will have high-speed free Wi-Fi. We launched it at the beginning of this year. Today, we have about 27 stations and already about 2 million monthly active users. We're doing a number of things to make sure that the products that we have are going to be usable and useful for the next 600 to 700 million people. Let's make sure the internet works in local languages. A billion Indians are not proficient in English. Let's make sure that our products work offline, because the reality is India today is already the world's first offline internet. If you take smartphone users in India today, they spend more time on their smartphones offline than online. First country in the world. We have a bigger offline internet than we have an online internet. We, launch, we launched YouTube offline about two years ago. It's in 77 countries. Fastest growing product we've launched in the history of Google in India. So let's make our products work offline. Let's make our products lighter. The reality is the Indian consumer is very data conscious. So how do you make sure that your apps or your services consume very, very little data? We've re-engineered just about every single product that we have to consume 90% less data than they have and to work just about perfectly on 2G networks. We're also focused on growing the entire ecosystem. And we've got a number of initiatives from getting women in rural India online, where over the next three years, we'll actually do ground level activation in 300,000 Indian villages to get Indian women in rural India online. And on the other end of the spectrum, we've launched an initiative to train, certify 2 million Android developers. 
Because at the end of the day, India is also the land of a billion problems. And in problems, there lies opportunities for innovation. And those innovations will be captured by Indian entrepreneurs. Today, India only has 50,000 mobile developers. And our goal and our commitment to the nation is that we will have 2 million trained and certified Android developers by the year 2018. We've also very focused on supporting the entrepreneurial ecosystem and a whole range of programs from very early stage companies all the way to late stage companies with Google Capital now being very active in India. So that's our mission in India. Now what I'd like to do is actually move to what does this large number of users who've already come online in India mean for businesses and more importantly, what do businesses actually do to make sure they capitalize on this incredible opportunity. The good news is at least today, most businesses and most CEOs recognize that several hundred million Indians are already on the internet. 75% of CEOs see technology change as the number one force that will impact their organization's future. So clearly, CEOs recognize it, management teams recognize it, and that we think is good. Because when I joined Google about five, five and a half years ago, this really wasn't still the case in India. Because five and a half years ago, we had barely crossed 100 million users. But today, the reality is, regardless of which industry you're in, regardless of what business you're in, CEOs realize the impact that technology and the internet is having on their businesses. Realizing this is very, very important because the reality is around the world, including in India, the pace of change is accelerating. If you look at the S&P 500, the average age of a company in the S&P 500 in 1957 was 75 years. The average age of a company in the S&P 500 in the year 2015 is 10 years. The lifetime of a company is shrinking. And what determines whether you're going to be a great company that is admired, that is performing well, and an extraordinarily irrelevant company is how well companies adapt to change. So not only is this important, it's actually an imperative. Not surprisingly, companies that embrace digital and become digital leaders perform much better on financial metrics. They grow revenue 9% above the median, they grow profitability even faster, 26% above the median, and not surprisingly, they're valued much higher than other companies. This phenomenon is also happening in India. Gartner recently published a very extensive survey that said this year, the cloud market in India will cross a billion dollars for the first time. $1.2 billion cloud services market in India growing at 30%. And what's exciting, is the conversation with CEOs and CIOs has changed. It used to be, why should I go to the cloud? And as all of you in this room know, that discussion has changed to how do I go to the cloud? How do I leverage the cloud? How do I capitalize on this incredible opportunity in front of us? And we are excited as Google to be working with a large number of companies, a large number of teams, a large number of CEOs and CIOs in the country on that. And they've turned to us to actually work with them and partner with them on their journeys. And they're doing that because they realize that Google is different. We don't have a chief innovation officer. Innovation is not something we've assigned to a specific person or a department. All of us in the entire company are innovators. It is part of what we do every single day to figure out how we can make it better. And we built a set of technologies that we both leveraged and now being used by billions of consumers for ourselves, to make ourselves more innovative. How can we collaborate better? How can we move much faster? How can we decide much more quickly? How can we partner with external firms much, much better? Ten years ago, we took these amazing set of technologies that we built for consumers and took those technologies and actually started working with businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and large businesses. And our goal was very, very simple. We wanted to democratize technology. We wanted to unshackle legacy. And that, we believe, is the journey that we're on. Progress, actually, globally has been very, very strong, as many of you know. Over 2 million businesses 
have gone Google globally. 60% of the Fortune 500 have gone Google. And in India, the progress has been absolutely fantastic. India today is one of the fastest growing countries for Google when it comes to the Google enterprise business. Many, many new age companies have gone Google. Flipkart, Snapdeal, the list goes on. But we also have a large number of traditional companies that have gone Google. From Hero Motor Corp to Jindal Steel and Power and companies like Wellspun. Over 1,000 companies that have more than 10,000 employees each have gone Google around the world. So not only has the journey started, but the journey is actually progressing very, very rapidly. And they're embracing Google and embracing Google technologies because we're smart, we're modern, and we're secure. We're a company that was born in the cloud, and if you look at the peer set of companies that are in the cloud space, Google was the company that was born in the cloud, so we understand the cloud. We're a company that has designed everything, everything that we do for real-time co-working from the ground up. And we are accessible from anywhere at any time for everyone. We build for everyone. It's modern. We don't do releases. Some of you still probably wait for the next release from some other partners. We don't have releases. We continuously innovate. And we are secure. Several billion consumers trust us with their data. We've took, taken all that amazing work that we've done and we've made it better for you, for the enterprise. Here's an example of one of the large enterprises around the world that is leveraging Google technologies to become more innovative. Let's run this video. Here at Whirlpool, we're the largest manufacturer of appliances in the world. Whirlpool has been around almost 104 years. It started right here in Benton Harbor, Michigan. We have 100,000 employees now worldwide. We're a very relationship-based company. We kind of have small town values. The center of everything is the customer because that's where our responsibility lies. Coming to work at Whirlpool, you get to work with some really great people and you get to be a part of products that are exciting, be able to execute our business well. It requires collaboration between sales, our merchandising teams, between our manufacturing, our product teams. The need that we have to be connected, the speed with which we need to operate have gone up. The opportunity to make a global company feel local, entrepreneurial, feel fast-paced, that's a big challenge. Google Apps helps us get there. What we've really done is create an opportunity for people to collaborate truly on a global basis, regardless of location, time, and place. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the speed at which we can operate. We're tracking our metrics all in one place for the entire team. We're looking at it and saying, how are we going to be able to deliver our products when our customers need it? The tools really do create that kind of empowerment to turn people loose to be creative and be their best self at work. We're really creating products that can make families' lives a little bit better in a behind-the-scenes kind of a way. When we think about our customer, we try to think about the way that they would want to spend their lives and how we can make that better. That's an example from Whirlpool. I want to end with this. There's no recipe for innovation. There's no secret sauce. Innovation is the magic that happens when you get great people with great ideas in an amazing culture and enabled with technology that is meant for innovation. And collaboration it's, is what it's all about. As companies, we need to change how we work. We need to change how we collaborate. And we believe at Google, we built the best set of technologies that enable collaboration, that enable innovation. And we believe the time has come. The time has come to move beyond licenses. The time has come to innovate, and the time has come to lead. And we believe that innovation is not about licenses, it's really all about leadership, and it's all about you. Now let's hear from one such innovation leader, a brand that we love, a brand that has been built entirely on the cloud, a brand that has built from absolutely nothing to an amazing brand in a very, very short period of time. 
I'm delighted to welcome on stage Piyush Ranjan, who's the Chief Technology Officer of Flipkart. Let's welcome Piyush. Thanks, Rajan. Hi, everybody. Hi, it's, it's great to be here. I also recognize a lot of faces in the crowd. In case uh, you don't know, I used to work at Google before. And it's great to be among uh, old friends, you know, great brands from all over India. So I'm here to talk to you about the journey Flipkart has taken and how the partnership with Google has worked in that context. So before we start, here is a question which I hear quite often is, why did you leave Google and go work at Flipkart, right? So let's, let's explore that a little bit. Here's how I saw Flipkart. It's a highly innovative company which is solving problems which are yet unsolved worldwide. I mean, as Rajan said very well, India is a country of a billion problems. And when you are trying to do e-commerce here, you cannot just take what has worked worldwide and apply it over here. And watching Flipkart create innovation after innovation, you know, solving this problem in a world where there are no credit cards, there is no FedEx and UPS, and making e-commerce work was fantastic. And what I felt is here's an opportunity that we can take the world-class uh, world practices of innovation, which you know, I learned at Google, and see how I can leverage them and cross-pollinate in another world-class innovative company like Flipkart. And here we are. But before we talk about Flipkart, let's talk about the context we operate in a little bit, India. Now, India is undergoing an access revolution. I don't know if you guys uh, saw the videos which played before the uh, talk started. Each one of them had a theme to it that more and more Indians are able to access the internet. As uh, pointed out earlier, there are around 350 million people who are online in uh, India today. Now just think about it, there are more people online in India today, there are more people can send you good morning WhatsApp messages in India today than there is entire population of United States. So there is that kind of current population growing very rapidly. There's an underlying revolution happening driven by drop in prices of smartphones. And all of this is really creating an opportunity for us to improve people's quality of life. Access to information is fundamental to quality of life. I was very moved by the video which I saw where the person who uh, was blind and then got treated was able to relive all the old memories. You could not have done that if you did not have access to internet. Memories get lost. But that was a fascinating uh, example of how somebody's quality of life can go up. And this premise is what allows Flipkart to work on its mission, uh, where our mission is enable commerce in India through technology. Now, one can say, well, is commerce a quality of life issue? Commerce is a quality of life issue in India for sure. It might be less where you, all you are saving is getting in the car and going to the mall and buying things. But when you are in a country like India, you want to make sure what you are buying is at the best price possible, you have the choices uh, available to everybody else, and your investment is secure. When you buy something, you get the best service and the best product out of it. These kind of things are non-trivial. I'll, I'll give you a short example. You know, I, like, let's go back 20 years, and, and I grew up in a small town in Bihar, in India, and I remember once uh, going to my dad and saying, you know, I want a Walkman. There was this girl in the, uh, down the street I wanted to impress. I was like, I want a Walkman. You know what my dad's response was? He said, and I'll say in Hindi, he said, Dilli jayenge to aayega. You know, means like, when I go to Delhi, I'll get it, right? Now imagine, that's my quality of life issue as a teenager, right? I want something. It is the most important thing in life for me. But what is stopping me is I cannot have it because we will have to go to Delhi, right? 
Now, if I struggle hard, if I go and look in the stores in my city or in my town, I will find something somewhere, but I will not find the Walkman I was looking for. It will not have the features it uh, wants. It will definitely not be the latest model which somebody in Delhi is sporting. Not good enough for me. It will definitely be more expensive than it would have been somewhere else because somebody went there, bought it, is sitting on the shelf, it's, it's biding its time, so the price is going up. And lastly, I have no confidence that what I'm buying is what I'm getting. If I walk into the store, if I hand over my cash, all my allowance, and I walk out of the store, the deal is done. If it doesn't work when I go home, good luck, right? So this is the situation, and obviously it's a quality of life issue for a teenager. The same example, obviously, this one I personally felt, but you can apply to everybody else. When somebody is willing to buy something and fork over their money, and they don't have selection, they don't have price, they don't have customer service, it is a quality of life issue. And that is something which we are trying as Flipkart to make sure is going up for everybody in India. They're able to buy what they want, at the quality they want, and it is affordable, and they get great customer service out of it. So this is Flipkart's uh, mission, transform, technology, is transform commerce through technology in India. Now let's see how do we do it, and this is how does Google help us do that. So, you know, how does Flipkart achieve its mission? The problems are all unique, uh, a whole plethora of them. How do we get everybody to come together and solve those problems? The number one thing you have to do when you have to solve problems in an innovative way is you have to get the best people to come together. Now, thankfully, and if you have observed, uh, LinkedIn uh, said Flipkart is the number one employer in the country right now, as voted by people on LinkedIn. Um, we have a brand which allows us to attract great talent. The kind of talent we want are engineers. You also know. Thanks to all the dads and moms and uncles and aunties, he become a doctor engineer. India is full of engineers. We are able to grab them. We are able to bring them in. They come, they believe in our mission, they work on it. So that's the number one problem, we go solve it. Number two, they have to have a clear mission. Very clear. Transform India's commerce through technology. If money is changing hands and there's a role technology can play in it, Flipkart wants to be the provider of that technology. Very clear mission. Then, what do you do now? You have to empower them. They, these are creative, self-driven minds. You want them to be able to work in the way they want to solve the problems that exist. So you have to empower them. You cannot shackle them, essentially unshackle, to steal a word from Rajan. You have to give them access to all the information they want to be able to do their work. Generally, companies, as they grow, information gets siloed. That does not work for innovation. You have to give them all information they want. Thirdly, you have to foster a collaborative work environment. People should be able to come together, work together on a common problem, and make progress. Now, these last three things, empowering the people, giving them transparency, and giving them a collaborative environment, is right where Google comes in. Think about this. Our, our workforce is, is self-driven, as I said. Um, they don't have to work nine to five. They can work from you know, Bangalore traffic, which I'm sure if you have seen is a very you know, obvious half your day spent there. You should be able to work from there. People are able to join video conferencing from there. They're able to you know, read documents, edit documents, a series of things which they can do. They can be at home. They don't have to be in office. All of that is possible to start with. Transparency-wise, you don't have to be forwarded a document or an email or, or something like that to be able to see the information you need. Everything is available on the internet. One search, you find it. If you have the permissions, you will get the information. And the collaborative work environment is built from ground up. All the, all the tools which we use to do our work are available in the cloud, and everybody can work wherever they are, whether you are in Maldives or you are in Maleshwaram, it does not matter. So long you have internet access, you can go and do your work. Of course, if you are in Maldives and you're trying to work, uh, you know, your family might really uh, 
put you in trouble, and Google Apps doesn't help with that. Um, but it's, it's amazing to uh, look at all this which is set up, and, and then take a step back and see what it has helped us achieve. Right? As I said, problems are immense, environment is innovative, people have come together. Have they been able to solve things? Absolutely. I mean, you guys know this. Flipkart started in 2007 from a small apartment room. Sachin and Benny started working together on this. Google tools were used from the very beginning where whatever was available was used. And today is the number one e-commerce company in India. It's one of the top startups in the world. It's 45% uh, market share in e-commerce in India. We have 17 warehouses. We have 90,000 sellers selling 40 million products. 75 million people are using them. It's fantastic progress, and the momentum continues. And it's all built by solving the problems which are there. So we look at this. Like, How did we achieve this with Google? We started from the very beginning. We used Google Apps. They're amazing mobile solutions which were there. Um, they were amazing collaboration tools in Google Docs, in, in uh, Google Sites, in uh, the spreadsheet, Gmail, all of these, Google Drive, all of these were used. And if we go a little deeper, I can tell you some of the statistics of how we are using them. We have, for example, in Google Apps, we have around 25,000 documents sitting in Google Drive which anybody at any time can access and learn more about the business if they have permissions, right? This is amazing. Otherwise, the same things will be sitting on people's files and folders here and there, and you'll be hunting down who has this and who has that. There are 9,000 groups which have been created on which people communicate. You know, this is removing the point-to-point -point information exchange. People work together. We have Google Sites. Google Sites is becoming the central repository of information which we are using for education and learning. If somebody knows something, they can create some information and learning uh, lessons, and they can put them on sites. If somebody else wants it, they can go there, they can uh, pull it down, they can learn. And it's all done in a very open, very transparent manner. People don't have to figure out where it is. This goes down to the transparency and access point. We use Hangouts. If you guys have not used Hangouts uh, for business, you should use it. It's amazing. We have just done it like a year ago. Um, we put 100 Hangout units. Now they're being used seven hours a day. People have stopped traveling between offices. They dial in. Amazing time savings, right? The second thing, which is the smallest little hack which we have seen, the wireless projection which we used to do, a lot of the time in the meetings used to go in people fiddling and saying, hey, is this the HDMI connector? Is this the VGA connector? Why is the projector not working? What is happening? All of that has disappeared. The meeting starts. People are able to immediately project what's on their laptop onto the Hangout, and everybody worldwide can see it. It's a fascinating experience. We also use Chrome to make our browsing more safe. We are able to put SSO policies on it, and we use technologies from Map for our logistics work. If I had to summarize in, in one sentence you know, what Google Apps helps us do, I would say it helps improve, improve employee productivity by enabling access, the transparency side, and the collaboration side. Right? But before I end, it is very interesting to note that this is all the employee side of things. But as you Im increase your information access, you have to make sure your information security also goes up. Otherwise, there are chances of leakage, there are chances of compromise. And there, it has been amazing to rely on the Google platform. As in one of the slides it was shown, there is a whole lot of security built into Google. Billions of users' data is safe over there. We use that as a turnkey solution for us. And we feel confident our data is as safe when it is uh, sitting inside Google Apps. For example, we use Google Accounts for authentication. Everybody gets... Uh, two-factor authentication immediately. When you log in, you get an OTP over the wire on your phone, then you use that. It makes it much harder for somebody else to hack into a, a Flipkart employee's account. We have ability to protect email, allowing, stopping people from inadvertently sending email outside of the uh, domain in, in, at times or with content they should not. 
we have the ability to audit Google Drive and be able to see, is somebody sharing information outside the company, and is that justified by a real business need? We are able to see who's downloading something onto their personal laptop. We are able to hold things if lawyers need access to it by using Google Vault. All of these things are at the back, which allow us to live in a secure environment provided by Google Apps, such that in the front, we can foster the innovation. So we are solving local problems in India through technology, as I said. There are big challenges ahead for Flipkart and for India. And Google is a strategic partner in this journey for us. Now I would like to invite someone who can tell you how Google Apps can help you catalyze and accelerate collaboration for your business. Here's, please welcome Bill Heppenmeyer, a veteran of Google's enterprise business, to tell you more about how you can create momentum for yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me on the mic? All right, now we're getting there. That's awesome. So it's great to be in Mumbai. It's my first time to India. It's amazing. I've been in the business now for a little over 30 years. And uh, I've traveled globally, but I've never had the opportunity to travel to this wonderful country. Now, the problem is, is that as I return, I'm going to have to be a little careful about the weight standards on the airplane, because uh, the Indian food here has been fabulous, and I think I've gained several kilos right here in the last couple of days. So let's, let's take the next step here and, and start to peel the layers of the onion back and, and start to maybe provide some insight into how companies like Flipkart are able to go from incremental change to orders of magnitude change in such a short, short time. And I think Rajan did a great job of setting the stage for the volume and capacity of the internet and what its impact has, the possibilities of that impact uh, here in India and abroad. So what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time and talk about some of that. So let's start by identifying and realizing sort of the obvious. And the obvious is, is that the world and the business community is moving at a faster pace, an unprecedented pace, a pace that is almost mind-boggling. And I don't think anybody at the sea level or anywhere in the company wakes up and says, you know, I think we ought to take it easy today. I think today is the day that we ought to just slow down a little bit and relax because the competitors out there are not going to catch us. The, innovation, the innovators out there are really not doing anything interesting. We've been in business for a hundred years. We are the king. That is not the, the state of any boardroom or any C-level executive that I've talked to. Every single person that I interact with globally is fearful of the pace of this change. So at Google, what are we doing to enable you to be able to address that change, respond to that change, and do it in a way to where you can move at the velocity necessary to be able to compete on a global scale from within India and across the world. I have a theory, right? So the theory is pretty simple. We're all looking for sort of this result, this result of transformation, this ability to be able to affect change, this ability to be able to drive innovation in the enterprise and beyond. My theory is, is that is really something that's it's the precept of that change the res that drives that result is the ability for you to be able to create big ideas and to have 10x thinking. But think for a minute in your mind, what is the precursor to, to that 10x thinking? I would assert or offer that the precursor to that is really creativity, and that creativity is initiated, activated, and promoted by engagement. Right? So if you think about engagement, interacting with your colleagues, interacting across the organization, interacting up the organization, interacting with your distributors, your suppliers, and then ultimately your customers, that I believe is the trigger, the catalyst, the beginning of that creativity which leads to big ideas which results in transformative application of that innovation that changes the, the market that changes your position in the market and gives you that competitive advantage. At Google, our focus is maniacal, is, is centered on being able to drive that process by starting with the engagement piece. Let's examine that a little bit more closely. 
So many of you, sort of, if you just look around you, the innovation has already begun, right? People are working differently uh, and have been for some time, right? We've talked about unlocking and unleashing and getting out of the trap of being in the office nine to five, but actually being able to work from anywhere. We do it from a variety of devices, and we expect much more from the mobile platform that we use every day than our desktop. In fact, um, and, and I'll, I'll be a little transparent here, I've got five kids, and I don't know how this happened, but the other day I looked up, this actually was in February, and my youngest, her name is Kelly, just turned 22. I don't know where the time went. But if we look at how my kids interact, they don't interact from a desktop. When they walk into work, they don't expect to be sitting in a cubicle and opening up their Mac or their Windows machine or whatever device they might have in front of them. They're working from mobile. In fact, if we're sitting at the dinner table, I have to physically grab the mobile out of their hands and put it on the side in order to have any meaningful conversation with them. Mobile is driving the way they work. More importantly is that from a productivity point of view, not only are they, are they focused on driving from mobile, they're also the most collaborative generation we've ever seen. And I illustrate this by a simple example, and I always pick up my daughter, Kelly, and if you talk to her, she'll tell you that she never did this, all right? She denies it to this day. But uh, to make a point, I was speaking at a conference in San Francisco, and I had about an hour to talk, and in the context of that hour, I thought, let's test something. I am going to send my daughter, Kelly, an email. And in the email, it says, urgent, ASAP, call, emergency, right? Didn't tell her what it was, but I said, I want to get her to call. Now, I knew that Kelly was not going to look at email. That's not the way she works. She's on Facebook. She's on Snapchat. She's doing text uh, and, and a variety of other technologies. She is working and collaborating different than my generation, different than the way many of the people who are running the companies today have been taught and trained to work. So sure enough, Kelly did not answer that email. At the end of the presentation, I popped up Google Apps and I sent her a simple SMS text message. And the context of the text message was this. I said, Kelly, when you return from your next semester in six months, what would you like to have for dinner and who do you want to invite from your friends? And literally within microseconds, you ever see the three little dots on, on, on a text message and all of a sudden you see they're responding? And sure enough, Kelly fires back a message and she goes, Dad, I'd like to go to this restaurant. I'd like to invite these three friends and I can't wait to be back. It's going to be great to see the family. The next question was really telling. I fired back a question and I said, Kelly, where are you right now? What are you doing? And she responded again as fast as you can be. She said, Dad... I'm taking a university examination. I'm like, what? But it illustrates the point. The millennials who are coming into the workforce have a much higher expectation of the tools and the capabilities that they're going to use to work. They're collaborating and sharing, and they're actually a group of people that we, from the older generation, can learn from. The problem is that's a start, but it's not enough. All right? In fact, you are bombarded with messages around the globe from people who are telling you that they can do the exact same thing that Google does. Microsoft, Box, Dropbox, IBM, there's a whole litany of vendors out there that are saying, we can do collaboration, we can make you productive, and I would argue that that's not true, they can't do it the same way, and we have a key competitive differentiator and advantage in this market, and it's one that you can use. So what is that? Well, it's the concept of being able to really promote this active engagement, which I'll talk about in a minute. What's interesting is when I talk to C-level executives around the country that have adopted these competitive platforms, I have a simple question. When we talked a year ago, we talked about engaging, we talked about creativity, we talked about driving transformation. Now that you've been on the new tool, Office 365, whatever the tool might be, what has fundamentally changed over the last year in your culture? What are you doing differently? How are you working more proactively? How are you engaging more directly? How are you having conversations with people that you haven't had before? And what everybody tells me without fail, 100% of the respondents, it's an informal survey, so it's not scientifically valid, right? But 100% of the people say, well, Bill, nothing's changed. We operate and work exactly the same way we always have. In fact, 
we work in this model. So for a minute, I want everybody in the room to think about a project that you have that you need to drive with velocity. A project, maybe it's a product introduction. Maybe it's something that you're working on to make a fundamental change in your operational excellence to reduce cost. Maybe it's something you're doing to be able to increase sales and grow top line revenue. And then I'm going to walk you through the two different ways to work. The way that I was trained when I first started work and the way that I work today as a Google employee. All right? So how would you be trained classically over the last 30 years to work? Well, what you would do is you would form a cross-functional team, right? You'd have a member from each one of the cross-functional stakeholder organizations and you would gather together to be able to work on this important and immediate and, and time-sensitive product. And how do you do that collaboration? Well, you sit down in front of your workstation all alone and you create a document. And then you take that document and how many people did this today? Don't raise your hand, but you know you're guilty. And you sent that document off to the five colleagues and you said, let's collaborate. Different place, different time, they're really not listening to you, they're not in tune with what you're thinking. That's not collaboration. So what do they do? They open up your document and they use track changes and they start editing and adding comments. They said, well, Bill, you know, I don't really like the color of this thing. That's not substantial. That's not really giving me an interactive value right there. And they start providing, well, you could reword this sentence a little bit differently. Then all of the team members send me back the document and what do I have to do? I have to take that and put it back together into version 1.3.6 and I send it back out and then we have a meeting on Thursday and everybody comes with a different version of the document. What document do you have? Well, I got 1.3.7. Well, what document do you have? Well, I got, I got 1.3.8, right? We're not working on the same page. We're not together actually collaborating and working in real time. And then we repeat that, right? Imagine how long it takes to go through three or four cycles of that style of collaboration. That is not the way to run your business. That is not the way to, to yield the transformation that I've been talking about. So is there an alternate mat, a path? Is there a different way to do that? Our model is modeled after the way we think you can work more effectively. Think about that same project now and think about grabbing those five or six people, those stakeholders, those value added, you know, people that can actually create value. And I bring them together in a conference room and what do we do? We start with an exercise where we examine the problem. Everybody gets out their sticky notes and we brainstorm and we collaborate and we go to the whiteboard and we start or arranging these different aspects or dimensions of the problem we're trying to solve. And at that moment, we actually have some form of consensus. We start to actually work together in a live, in real-time fashion to where we have a much better understanding and a broader perspective of the problem. We then generate alternatives. We then go ahead and rank those alternatives in terms of risk, probability, effectiveness, ability to execute. We choose one of those alternatives, and at the end of that four-hour session in the conference room, we're able to actually select a plan of action and go back to our boss and say, here is what we recommend. Not what I recommend, not what James recommends, not what Mohit recommends. Here is what we as a team agree to do to be able to address this problem. So what does that look like? Because we can't all get in the same room, right? We're in four different places, right? We're in Gurgaon, we're here in Mumbai, we're down in Pune, uh, we're in Bangalore, right? We're spread all over the country. Well, the way that works is using a set of tools that were designed from the ground up to solve that problem. We collaborate in real time from mobile and from the desktop. We interact together in these documents. And what invariably happens is I get to a point in the document, I need input from legal. So I ping Shailesh, right? My colleague in legal and Shailesh gets an email and says, oh, Bill, you really need to talk to Mohit, all right? So Mohit is then brought into the conversation right there, and in email, Mohit can read the comment, can make some sort of response, and while I and my colleagues are in the document, we get Mohit's input, which was directed from Shailesh. So we're making social connections as part of the fabric, connections with people that we never really knew had any input in this problem and we're able to expand the collaboration to bring in the expertise that we need to be able to drive the right result. The second aspect of this collaboration is that the real time is done in real time and we're building intimacy with the players that are on the team. The difference between receiving an email 
talking on the phone and then having a live conversation via Hangout is dramatic. What happens is when I'm interacting with someone in real time via Hangout and I'm looking at their face, I can see their body language, I start to say something that disturbs them and I get immediate feedback. I then can react to that feedback and I'm sensitive to their concern and I can actually iterate to the right answer faster because I have this very vibrant in real time dialogue with one of my colleagues and we work better together because we build trust. We work better together because we're transparent. We work better together because it's real time. So it's real time document editing, it's real time collaboration via Hangouts and it's done from a variety of devices where I can literally move from one device to the next device transparently and I'm backed by one single store in Google Drive of all the contacts. So when I invite a new player to the conversation, so Just Vendor just joined the team and Just Vendor wants to get up to speed quickly on all the artifacts and all the work that we've done. He's missed the last three weeks of this engagement. All I have to do is bring Just Vendor into the team space, the shared drive, and he can immediately and effectively catch up because he can review all the content because it's stored in one place and we all can examine and share and work together. And then of course, and it's been mentioned a couple of different times, it's got to be secure. If I'm going to share the next big idea or the company uh, financials or whatever it might be as I collaborate, I've got to be able to limit who can see it, under what circumstances, and what time frame uh, they're able to do. And more importantly, I need to have control over what they can do in the document. Are they a viewer? Are they an editor? Are they a collaborator? Are they able to substantially change the content or do I want them to simply review, comment, and approve? Having that control is essential to a platform that is going to catapult you from engagement to creativity to big 10x ideas to transformation. And then to round it out, it's very important that we're all working on the same context. How many times, again, we go back to that version 1.3.6 versus 1.3.7, are you working from information that is too old and not current? Having everyone look at the same document with one version, right, with one source of truth is critical to your being able to move forward. So we believe that in Google Apps that we are equipping you for a new style of collaboration. We believe we have the ability through apps to empower you to actually reach that transformation that I spoke of earlier and do it in an effective way that is differentiated in the market entirely. And so I really think you have to compare and contrast these two different styles of work. On the left, both are sailboats, but on the left, you have one author, you have one pilot, you have one, uh, one, one person who's got the rudder, and everybody else is a bystander, is a watcher, is a participant only in the sense that they get to view the vista, but they're not actually contributing to the speed of the boat, the operation of the boat, the direction of the boat. On the right, you have a team of people that are working collaboratively together to achieve a new outcome, which increases the velocity and capability of being able to, in this case, sail effectively, in your case, move a project forward that is going to make you uh, win in the marketplace. So what results can you expect? Number one is that you're going to finish projects in a much shorter time because the velocity is supported by the tool set. Number two is that you're going to save a lot of time, right? Think about saving a minute here and a minute there. In fact, we found that in calendar alone, with the innovations we're making, people are spending on average 600 minutes per month doing calendaring activities and by adding smart and intelligent assistance in calendar we believe we can reduce that by an order of magnitude and get you down to maybe between 10 and 20 minutes per month doing calendaring activities because we're coming al alongside with intelligent components and assistance that will help you do that better. And then of course lastly it allows you to integrate your life. I don't live to work, I work to live. What's most important to me is Kelly, my kids, my wife. So what we're able to do is we're able to allow you to balance that work-life capability, have access to the things you need when you need them, but be there for the moments that matter. 
So I could go a little bit on in terms of why companies are choosing us, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to skip through this section in the order of time. And what I'd like to do is take the next step in this journey and introduce the next speaker. So our next speaker, speaker Carolina, is going to talk a little bit about the journey if you were to choose to come together with us. If you want to move from Google Apps or move from your current uh, capability in terms of collaboration and platform to Google Apps, there's a process, there's a methodology, and there's a strategy for doing that, and Carolina is going to walk you through that whole process. So thank you very much. Kasakai, Mumbai. Good morning, Mumbai. I'm Karolina Lewandowska, and I'm a customer change and transformation lead based in London, supporting our customers and partners across EMEA and Asia Pacific. I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about how you can adapt to the digital transformation changes, to work in new ways, and to help your employees to bring the modern workplace into your organizations. But to start, we've been sitting for over one hour now. I would like to invite you to stand up, please. OK. And now, put your arms out in front of you and cross your arms, as you would, not, uh, as you would do naturally. Fold your arms. How does it feel? Good, comfortable, natural, and the reason it feels comfortable is because you've done it probably many times before, and you have formed the habit of doing this. And now, put your arms back out, and this time, fold your arms the other way. How does it feel now? A little bit uncomfortable, right? It certainly does for me. And the reason it feels uncomfortable for you is because probably some of you have done it for the first time and you haven't formed the habit of doing this. Thank you very much. You can sit down now. Thank you very much for playing this short game with me. In fact, apparently it takes 250 times of crossing and uncrossing arms to feel absolutely comfortable with that. So change is sometimes uncomfortable, and that's something I will talk to you about today. So do you recognize here the faces of change? So every time we as humans are being faced with change, we are likely to respond in one of those four ways. And I saw all of those reactions when we did our crossing arm exercise just now. Some people immediately got up, and they became navigators. They felt empowered. They didn't know what I, would what I would ask them to do, but they jumped in it and followed my instructions straight away. Some people simply ignored me. They stayed sitting down. They were bystanders. And some people gave me this suspicious look and were probably thinking, who is this crazy girl on stage? I don't want to listen to her. So what's very important is that you as leaders, when you're introducing a large-scale changes in your organizations, which the uh, technology projects will be, that you expect and anticipate all of these reactions from your employees. Change is a journey. And even for those of us who are experts in the psychology of change, we go through all the stages every time we're faced with the change. That's normal, and it's something to be expected. Unlike our crossing and uncrossing arm exercise, which doesn't really have any benefit either way you do it, bringing a new technology in your organizations will have some tangible benefits to your employees and to your business. So I would encourage you to go through all, this uh, all the stages of this journey and support your employees, and not to be put off by the slight dip, which is denial and re resistance phase, 
because the benefits are worth it. So persevere. Also, at each of those stages, your employees will need different type of support. And at Google, we are here together with our partners to support you along this journey. So I want to switch now and give you a couple of tips of how you can deal with change. So there is a very nice saying that if you want to change the behavior of people, you need to connect with them on three levels. Head, heart, and feet. Let me explain what I mean by that. So head means that you have to connect with people at a very rational level. You need to explain to your employees why you're introducing changes in the company, why are you expecting them to change their behavior in a non-trivial way, what's the business value, and how the whole technology project aligns with goals and vision of your company. So explain the rationale. Now, heart. Heart is the emotional uh, level. You need to connect with your employees at the emotional level. And I think it's the most challenging, especially when it comes to IT projects. There are two ways you can do it. Firstly, finding the benefits for all your employees as individuals that the change is bringing to them. So unleash what's in it for them. People are all selfish in the end of the day, and we all need to know how am I personally going to benefit from that change. Secondly, make sure that you involve your employees into the projects. Make them feel that it's their project too. When people, feel, when people are involved in the project, they will do their best to make this project successful, and at the same time, they will highly contribute to the, to the success of your tra digital transformation. And then the last part, feet. Feet is when the behavior change comes into play. Feet is all about skills and abilities that people need to be successful in a new modern workplace. So remember, head, heart, and feet. And by the way, this concept doesn't only work in the workplace. Every time you're facing changes in your personal life, test this concept because it's really working. So managing change and supporting your employees along the journey it's not, going, it's not only going to be beneficial to your employees, but also to your projects. And I've decided to highlight a couple of studies here, but basically when you support your employees with change on a project, that project is very likely to have a higher return on investment. So we hear a lot about the pace of change that is constantly increasing, and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. So as organizations, we need to build agile culture to respond to ongoing changes. And organizations who do a really good job at managing change are three, times, three and a half times more likely to financially outperform their industry peers. So focus on the cultural aspect, uh, this is gonna, as the culture is going to play a key role in your long-term transformation. So at Google, we've developed a customer success methodology that includes a number of templates, best practices, and some specific steps that you can follow to make your project successful. Today, I would like to share with you my six top tips. Tip number one is around leaders. So as we heard this morning, leaders must lead by example and walk the talk. If you're trying to change the behavior of your employees, you need to be a role model for that particular behavior. So I would encourage you to try new technology, to collaborate with your teams, 
and also share your personal insights and observations around that technology. Tip number two is, a, is, is, around, is about involving, you, involving your employees in the project. And this is my favorite picture out of the whole presentation. Um, at, uh, in our methodology, we've got one of the most, the most powerful concepts is the, con the concept, the network of power users. We call them Google Guides. And these are the Google Guides from the company here in India, Wellspan. They basically had 165 employees, over 5% of their company population, uh, contributing to sharing best practices, participating in the communications and training. With the, that was a flagship Google Guides program that highly contributed to the increase of product adoption, and also they started innovating by re-engineering their business processes too. At the same time, they made the change fun too. Tip number three is around making sure that you explain to people why the change is happening. So that's the rational part that I mentioned before. Oftentimes, we communicate what's happening, when it's going to happen, how we're going to do it, but we keep forgetting why. As adults, we need that additional rational explanation why we're doing something to be on board. Tip number four is about your culture. So when we, when we talk about digital transformation uh, changes, oftentimes technology enables the culture of innovation and enables culture change as well. So think about what's the organizational culture now in your companies, and what do you want it to be? Do you want your users to innovate? Do you want your employees to collaborate, to share ideas freely? Think about what's the company culture you would like to introduce in your organizations. Once you have this one figured out, try to work out what are the key uh, behaviors and attributes of your ideal employees. And then when you're hiring for a new talent, focus on hiring people who are going to fit that culture you are trying to build. Tip number five is around skills. It's very important while introducing and driving changes in the, in the organizations to equip people with skills and abilities they need to be successful in a, new, uh, in a new modern workplace. People resist change if they feel that they don't have skills needed to be successful. So make sure that you have a proper change management strategy around training and support and knowledge that people need to access to, do, to perform well in a new workplace. And the last tip, tip number six, is around making sure to reward and recognize those who went extra mile when, it, when you were introducing the technology. So once you identify those navigators in your organization, turn them into real superstars. They are going to play a key role in the long term, uh, in the long term to make sure that your company achieves a long-term success. And with that, I would like to finish with a famous quote of Einstein, that's my favorite quote. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And the message here is that it's a high time to try something different and to move our employees to a moder to more smart and modern way of working. Today, we heard a lot about our partners, the role they play in landing new technology in your organizations. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. Deepankar from PwC, our global strategic partner, who will talk to you about how they have embraced the cloud and how they have now partnered with Google to help you move to the cloud too. Thank you for listening.
very much, Carolina. That's really, really uh, very, very amazing and very practical way of embracing change. Uh, we do that and we face that with our clients when we help them embrace new technologies each day. And we do find that change management is often the deal breaker or the biggest success factor, how you would manage that. So I think so is very relevant to us. Yeah, for I, as PwC a leader, is also working with Google as a partner, but also we are a customer of how we went Google. So I'm going to talk more about the latter because that is a true experience, which I think so is important for the people around here. How many of you saw the debate yesterday on GST? All right, okay, a few of you saw that. How many of you believe it is just a tax issue and nothing else? I'm glad no one. It is less of a tax issue and more of a business issue. Our assessment is that fundamentally it is a technology issue. Because every organization will go through a fundamental shift in how they operate with the implementation of GST. Our entire models have been built on a, how do I create tax efficiency? Lo and behold, with one uniform rate, we will be forced because our ecosystem will be how our models are now built, what they were always supposed to be, which creates efficiencies in running a business, be it transportation, be it my supplier side of uh, dealings, be it uh, how I deal with the customer, warehousing, so and so forth, everything. Now, why am I giving this example? I think so, if the next eight to nine months, which we all have to undergo a change, I think so it's a fantastic time for you to start thinking because there'll be a huge technology change which we all have to do. Great time to think about, can we entirely change and say, okay, let's go Google. So it's important to think on those lines and I think so you can leverage or something like this, changes which are coming through and hitting us with regularity and how we need to change ourselves. At PwC, our purpose is to build trust in society and solve complex problems. Solve complex problems to you as they arise and turn them into opportunities, something like what, Google, what GST is. We do work from strategy through execution, right helping build strategy, and then execute it, including the technology part. We are on cyber, cyber security, and you know that security is a big topic which is there, and I'll delve much more on that part because that's something personally close to me. Uh, we work with government, for example, the MyGov platform, we manage that. It's a cloud platform. It's a platform, so government is embracing Google. It's a platform for the prime minister's office, how they interact with the citizenry of the country. Now, what does that really mean for us as a customer of Google? So the three things were about smart, about modern and about secure. But to me, security was the number one aspect. The reason being perhaps I'm biased towards that is I'm a forensic professional. I have done investigations and I've, I've done investigations on financial fraud, on information security hacks frauds, anything and everything. You think of a type of an issue, I would have done that and, and investigated that. So naturally for me, security is, is paramount. So we did a study. We did a study some time back, and our estimation was India lost around $20 billion to financial frauds. Could be through the NPA type of a model, could be uh, uh, issue, could be through just uh, you know, cyber terrorism, could be cyber extortion, could be just financial statement fraud. Whatever it is, that's our estimate. Hell of a lot of money. What you don't want is to create an added issue to lose money because and when your information systems are not up to the mark. So for us, having a system, a partner which is secure was of paramount importance. And you know, we are auditors, we also do a lot of audit. Like any true auditor, we looked at every system and we looked at okay, various platforms which are available, and our audit guy said, you know, Google is the way to go. 
So the Google platform really provides us that security. To give an analogy, right, I'm, I'm sure some of you may have heard the story. Uh, there were two guys who were in a forest, and suddenly a wild bear comes and starts chasing them. One of them starts running. The guy says, the other guy says, why are you running? You can never outrun the bear. He said, no, I'm not trying to outrun the bear. I'm trying to outrun you. The point is that if, if you go for 100, 100% security, the cost will be too high, and we all make those cost-benefit analyses. But can my system be that much more secure than someone else's? So if someone wants to, so that as a target, I'm the least attractive target. And there are people out there all the time trying to figure out to get into your systems. Our cyber security practice has grown from 100 people to 500 people in two years. And we still don't have enough people on board. We're actually partnering with universities now to create talent for us in this space. So for security, it's really, really important. The next one is about being a secure conversation. Oh, sorry, about a modern conversation. And here, I would just say that as we leaped as an economy from a landline type thing straight into the 4G, and, and that has become a backbone, I think so, going Google and a cloud app environment is an opportunity, a similar opportunity which is available to us. And I think so we should leverage of that. The other thing which has been touched upon earlier is regarding our people. Our average age of employees is 27. I bet it will be very similar to many of your organizations. And as I said, this group is enabled in the way they operate in a technology-friendly way. If our organizations do not operate the same way, well, we will not be their choice of uh, place of work. So for us to provide that, it has a very good people aspect too as to why you want to go on an organization like this. Third part, smart. Why smart? I'll talk to you about the, for us as an organization, we are in the business of a knowledge company, right? So we need a partner who can help work with us to think smartly, to talk about people's and organization's problems. So here is an example what Google brings as a smart technology. There was a company, DeepMind, which, got, which, uh, which uh, created an artificial intelligence software which was around playing video games just like humans do. Google bought this out, I think it's 2014 or something, and they re renamed it Go because of the Chinese game Go, which is a 19-column metric. If you know chess, chess is an 8 by 8 and it has got tremendous number of permutations. Go makes it limitless. The most complex game, Chinese game. The, this technology played a game against Lee Seedol, who's the number two person in this space, and beat it. What's the relevance today? The relevance is that that's the type of technology, whilst we don't see it, that's what is helping you do your work. Now, why wouldn't you want something like that? I bet we can put all our minds together. That's not something which we'll be able to create. Lastly, innovation was talked about a lot. And I think so innovation is, again, key for us. We will not be in business for probably not even 10 years if we do not innovate and be at the cutting edge of finding solutions for our companies. And I think so this is what a platform like this allows us. The next bit for us was that, OK, you've chosen Google. What does it take for us to make it happen? We are a complex organization, PwC. We are in 150 countries, a uh, huge number of employees. How do we make it happen for ourselves? Right? And that, that was a factor which was quite key to us. So first point is really was the approach to technology as a user's perspective. And I think so as Bill talked about, as how we have kept the user in the front, that actually works. So for us, it was, we are quite surprised. It was a lot of it was kind of a plug and play type of situation. 
So that was really helpful. It increased collaboration tremendously. Last night, I, was, I had to be here and then I had to rush off. Why? Because I had a conversation, a call with my counterparts in the US. Guess what? Leveraging Hangouts. So very practical way of working on these things. Second, we want our offering to be agile. That means we want to be working with our customers, we want to be working there so that we address their cost needs simultaneously. We want to pay for what we use. We don't want to be, we want to be working on what we are good at and leave the others to something, someone else. Third, our clients are global in nature. Indian companies are going global. So I'll give you an analogy, another example of what we are doing. In our digital practice, we've got Experience Labs now. Experience Lab is a place where a company can come in and we can play around with various technology and user interfaces to see how a interface will look like, feel like, operate like in the real world. Okay? So it gives you a secure environment. Now, they can come to our Bangalore one and do that. That's fine. We've got seven, eight of them around the globe. But what we do, everything is on cloud. Anything like that comes up, we immediately start collaborating across these seven, eight centers. So innovation happening at one place automatically without any effort is available to somewhere else and also available to the, our customer. Very, very powerful. Third, our cooperation with Google, as I said, we are a customer, but because we saw the power and saw the change it brought for us, we are also an alliance partner. So we do the consulting bit, and along with Google, we help to bring it into our clients. So that was in two bits of you know, self-sales. Last and not long as the least, it is security. Again, security. I cannot emphasize that enough. So thank you very much for being here and talking to us. And now I'll have James Snow come on board, come over and talk more about security. Thank you very much. Have a good day. All right. Good afternoon, Mumbai. Um, my name's James Snow. I'm the global product strategist focused on security and compliance for Google for work, for government, and for education. Um, I've actually been here all week uh, enjoying your hospitality. I've been meeting customers. And before I get into our Google presentation, I would like to tell you my Indian security story. I got to meet yesterday with the chief security officer of one of the largest financial institutions here in Mumbai. And they had security like I had never seen before. We came up with the car, and they had this special gate in front of the building with the bars. I got to get out and go through the gate and sign a book and show a passport. I then went through another gate to the front, where I went through a metal detector, a scanner. I got fricked. I then went to another gate and signed another book, and I got a badge. I got a badge and a security guard. I got taken to an elevator. I went into an elevator. I went to the top. I met yet another security guard, and I got taken to the CSO's office. Amazing security. I felt like I was meeting the prime minister. I felt very special. <laughs> now, when I got up and spoke to the CSO, I asked him how all this security was working for him. What challenges was he facing in his business? And he told me that he was facing tremendous pressure, and he's not alone. Every business is seeing this problem. They're seeing attacks from external vendors. They're trapped on old devices. They're trapped in this idea of old and traditional security that is not meeting the modern needs of the enterprise. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about what Google does for security, what we do differently, and what we can bring to you to help solve those security problems. So first, a few cool things about Google. Let me use all the Google secrets you came to hear today. So this is a picture of one of our data centers. It's not really even a, a great picture. But the important thing about this picture is everything you see here is custom made for and by Google. What does that mean? On any given day of the year, we're the world's third or fourth largest manufacturer of servers in the world. 
We make everything from the chipsets on the motherboards to the proprietary operating systems to the applications that run on top of them. Now, from a security perspective, what does this mean? It means that we are not subject to third-party security problems from other platforms. We don't have a Patch Tuesday here at Google, right? Our platforms, our equipment is not available on the consumer market. It makes it very difficult to engineer, but we're just getting started. That's just servers. We were born in the cloud. And what is the cloud if not a network? At Google, we build all of our own network equipment. We're talking switches, routers, but not just the equipment themselves. We use our own proprietary networking protocols. We use different protocols for different data centers. So if you were to try and intercept communications on our network, your gear would not be able to speak the same language that we do. Now, let's keep talking about that network, about our cloud. We operate the largest IP network in the world. Larger than any telco, larger than any government. Again, what does that really mean? It means dark and light fiber across every continent on the planet. Our network not only connects our data centers to each other, but it connects our data centers to nearly every ISP in the world. On any given day of the week, we are handling between 25 to 38% of total internet traffic. This is mind-boggling. What does this mean from a security perspective? If you have a global company or a local company, you do not have to traverse back to a data center within a different region. You go from your device to your internet service provider to Google's network now. And this is how we can provide high performance, low latency, and high availability across not just all of our consumer products, but especially to our enterprise products. This network I'm referring to, you can directly peer with it. If you have offices here in India, we have three endpoints which you can partner with for high availability reasons. Now, that network, it is really big. It isn't just crossing several continents. We currently have 13 undersea cables across the Atlantic and the Pacific. This is truly massive, and we're constantly building this out, including here in India. Now, let's talk about some really, really interesting stuff. So this is where we start talking about how do we protect your data. Now, what I need you to do is I need you to forget everything you know about IT. If you're not an IT person, good, good, we're already there. I want to explain how we protect your data because it is completely different than what everyone else does on the market. This is state-of-the-art, next generation. Now, I need you to understand a couple of key concepts. The first concept is everything is based on a user. Next is everything is based on an application. So if you have a Gmail account, you have a database that has all of your emails, your attachments, everything you need to search that content. You will also have a separate database for your Google Drive content, for all of your documents, whatever you choose to store there. It's all there, it's all separate. It's not per company, it's not per region, it's about you as an individual. Now, what happens when you want to, say, put a document in Google Drive? Well, the first thing that happens, as we talked about that amazing network, is every connection that you're going to have to Google is going to be over an encrypted connection. And not just any type of encryption. We're talking extraordinarily strong encryption. In fact, we announced just a couple weeks ago that we're experimenting with new cipher suites to counteract the future threat of quantum computing to break encryption in transit. Our encryption in transit is stronger than commercial VPNs and stronger than even some military-grade VPNs, and this is something that we have as a part of all of our services. It doesn't matter if you're going through the website or an API. There's simply no way to have an unencrypted connection to Google. Once you've established your encrypted connection, you want to upload your file. Now, when you upload your file, let's say, to Google Drive, here's where it starts getting really interesting. It goes to what we call the, the Drive application, and we want to store that file in your Drive database. When we do that, that database is first broken into thousands of little pieces. Each piece will go through the following process. It will first go through what we call algorithmic-based encryption. So this will take it, turn it into ciphertext so it's unreadable, and you can only decrypt it on a Google machine attached to a Google, Google network. First, algorithmic-based encryption. Then, key-based encryption. Industry standard AES. We will encrypt it a second time. 
The key that we produce after that encryption process, we'll encrypt yet again with a wrapping key and store that in our key management system. So that, that was a lot. This is as technical as we're getting today. All right, so let me review. Database, thousands of pieces, algorithmic encryption, key-based encryption. We're going to wrap that key and we're going to put that in our key management system. We haven't gotten to the cool part yet. The cool part starts with replication. We're going to take every single piece of that database and we're going to replicate it across our global data center infrastructure. So in data center number one, we're going to have it uh, five times on different drives, on different servers, with different connection to the internet. Five more times data center number two. Five more times data center number three. Five more times data center number four. This is happening in real time. You might think, this is crazy. Google, why do you do this? We do this in order to provide high availability and low latency. If we have an outage at a data center, if one of our undersea cables becomes disconnected, if there is a network problem, our infrastructure is self-adjusting and self-healing. When it becomes time for you to get your file back again, what happens? The algorithm goes out. It gets every single copy of every single piece. It pulls it together like a race. It's going to de-encrypt it, de-obfuscate it, reassemble it, and present it to you in real time. It's a computer science miracle, right? I'm giving you a demo of that right now. When you think about how you're storing or you're protecting your data today, how is that working? Is it on one server? Is it on two? Is it protected at the file level? Is it protected at the fragment database level encrypted at multiple times? This is state of the art, and this is what we do to protect our data within Google. We run the same platform that we offer to you, and we offer you the exact same level of protection. So there are no tricks here. That process that I described is used for every single Google for Work application out there, from Gmail to Google Drive to Hangouts. It's all universally protected with this scheme. Now, when I talk to CSOs and security professionals, believe it or not, the security conversation actually goes pretty easily. It used to be that people were afraid of the cloud, and they'd say it's not secure. The conversation has changed. It now says, well, I believe Google has amazing security, but how can I trust Google with my data? What are you doing with it, right? And the number one area of confusion I get is a, con a confusion between what we offer for free for our consumers and what we offer for our enterprise customers, for schools, for governments, for businesses. Everyone knows that for our free products, yes, we are using that to create and serve advertising. Yes, my grandmother knows this, so I know that everyone here knows this as well. For our enterprise customers, we operate by a completely different set of rules. We have to. You are the owner of the data. You are the data controller, and we're the data processor. We can only use the data how you instruct us. What can we use your data for? It's very simple. We can only use the data to provide the service you're requesting. That means no advertising, no profiling. We can't even use that data to improve our own services. Very clear. Intellectual property of the data. Who has the rights for intellectual property? Another easy answer. You do. You have 100% of the rights. Google has none under any circumstance. Last but not least, most important, portability of data. After our presentations today and you fall in love with Google and you move all of your data onto our platform and then next week you decide you want to break up with us, that would make me personally very sad, but if you did, you can move all of your data immediately back off. There's no penalty. It comes off in industry compatible formats, in a Microsoft format, an open office, a PDF, whatever you desire, there's no penalty. There's no lock-in. There's no three-year EA. You can decide where you want to have your data and how you'd like to have that controlled. And this is for our software as a service. Think about our infrastructure as a service offerings with things like Kubernetes and containers. You can seamlessly move workloads from our cloud to others as availability or pricing changes. You are the controller of your data. We only do what you instruct us. So. At Google, another huge differentiator is that we operate one secure cloud. We don't have a cloud for government and a cloud for healthcare and a cloud for India and a cloud for the US. We have one secure cloud because when you look at our business, we are a global business. And as soon as you have more than one security environment, one of them becomes less good than another. 
And because we have one global cloud, we look at saying, well, how can you trust what Google does with, with your data? It is saying, don't trust us. Trust but verify. We have independent third-party certifications across our entire platform. Now, some of these are the, the greatest hits. So ISO 27001, the, the, the grandmother of security certifications. We have that one. But ISO 27017 is brand new. That's the cloud standard for security. We meet that as well. We have FedRAMP certification. This is the certification for security for doing business with the US government. We can handle all data under classified. You have that same protection, that same independent audit of the infrastructure that you would be using as well. Now, I want to call out one special certification. So remember when I said that security is easy? What happens with our data? It's ISO 27018. This is a brand new cloud data privacy certification. And the way that this works is first you have to have security. So ISO 27018 has 117 security controls. So Gmail, Google Drive is secure. ISO 27018 is built on top of that. And that is doing an audit of the application and what happens with the data. Is it encrypted properly? Are access restrictions in place? Is the data being used for any other purpose? And we have that audit, that certification completed by our third party for our entire Google for Work pro uh, platform. This is very, very helpful when we start talking about regulated industry or if there are concerns around data privacy. All of these certifications, these are all public. These are all things that can be shared with your users, that can be shared with your regulators. Now, Last but not least, Google spends an awful lot on security. We're going to be talking about what we spend on infrastructure and what we do operationally, but we spend just on security alone every year over $2 billion. And part of that is saying, well, James, that's a really great slideshow, but I'm not sure I believe you. Google was the first company to offer a public bug bounty program. Every piece of software that is not in our data center is open sourced and available. We pay hackers, friendly and less friendly, uh, millions of dollars every year to help improve our products. And you, as an enterprise customer, can include this. As a citizen, you can try and break in. Uh, as a company, you can run a penetration test. Um, I've talked to the British government. They've actually moved onto our platform, the Cabinet Office, uh, Revenue and Customs. And when I spoke to their security officer, I said, why don't we have a penetration test on the government's network and Google and see who comes out ahead? Uh, needless to say, they're our customer now. So that's gone out very well. And again, we welcome this sort of input. Security that isn't tested can't be trusted. And if you do a really good job, uh, I can give you a t-shirt, some money, a really, really good job, maybe even a job. So I'll just put that out there. So with that, I'd like to close, and I would like to invite up to the stage uh, Rick from our cloud platform team to talk even more in depth about our infrastructure, about our security controls, and thank you so much for your time today, and thank you for attending. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Hello, Mumbai. It's great to be back here. I've been coming to Mumbai for you know, more than a decade, and I always enjoy coming here and meeting with customers and partners. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today about the Google Cloud Platform. But before I talk to you specifically about GCP, I think it's important to understand where companies are today. Companies are going through a seismic shift in the way that they're approaching their businesses. They're moving from individual productivity and being IT being siloed to looking at collective intelligence and moving towards distributed computing. And this is fundamentally important to understand as companies are trying to drive through digital transformation. And at Google, we're focused on helping enterprise customers benefit from this transformation. It also, also helps to understand the amount of investment that Google is making in cloud infrastructure. In 2015 alone, we spent nearly $10 billion and building out global cloud infrastructure. And that investment has spurred innovation and a tremendous growth across the platform. As you can see from these stats, we've seen in the past year 10x growth in our storage usage. We've seen 4x growth in our compute usage on our platform, and more than 25 times growth on our container service. Now, to bring that to full, 
That means that we're doubling the number of containers that are deployed every 90 days. It's tremendous growth across our cloud platform. Before I talk about the future and where we believe things are heading in the cloud, I think it helps to understand the current state that most enterprises find themselves in. So the first wave of data centers, when you moved from owning and managing your own data centers, really you saw the rise of co-location facilities. And this happened about 20, 25 years ago. Now that created a greater level of efficiency for businesses, potentially lower cost, but was still built on physical infrastructure. That second wave then moved into virtualized data centers. API calls, greater efficiencies, really you saw a rise of what we call cloud computing. That's the wave that we're in right now. Now again, you see greater efficiencies, very much more automated than you saw in co-location, lower cost, but there's still a long way that we can go. And we believe at Google that Next is going to consist of enterprises leveraging and building intelligent services and automating everything. And as we are currently in the second wave of data centers, there are many improvements that we feel that you can continually make as we remain in the second stage and build towards Next. So this better second wave really consists of a number of things. Looking at security, as James just mentioned, from a holistic approach backed by certifications. And that's an important point that James made. Having a global network, having the largest software-defined network in the world, as James just mentioned. Focusing on open standards, okay? We really want to maximize capabilities, but minimize lock-in. For those that work with other cloud providers, you'll know that that's actually the opposite of their mindset. We focus on industry-leading infrastructure. So we want to continually be the leaders in price to performance when you look at our services. And we want to be customer friendly. When you think about our pricing philosophy, we fundamentally think that you should be able to pay on a per minute basis. If you're going to run a workload on GCP and you're going to run it 24 by 7, we're going to automatically give you sustained usage discounts. We're going to continually innovate when it comes to a pricing philosophy and give you the best performance. And at the same time, we're working on building what's next, not only for ourselves, but also for our customers. So we're innovating at all levels. As James mentions, we built the hardware, software, and operational models that run not only for Google, but also the Google com Compute or Google Cloud Platform and for our customers. We created Kubernetes, and we shared that with the world. And that container engine is really providing a production-grade container orchestration, giving you the ability to run more servers efficiently. And as James mentioned, it allows you to port workloads into multi-clouds or on-premise or on GCP. That innovation came from Google. Our data platform, it's focusing, allowing you to focus on insights, not on your infrastructure. So Google will do the heavy lifting. And then bringing machine learning to the mainstream. So there are three key pillars of the Google Cloud Platform, infrastructure and operations, application development, and data and analytics. So let's spend some time diving into how Google Cloud is different. So some differentiators from a compute perspective. We are the only cloud platform that currently provides a live migration service. So we will manage not only the maintenance of the underlying infrastructure, but we will also ensure that your application stays up while we perform that maintenance to our platform. We are the only cloud provider that offers this feature. Custom machine types, no over-provisioning. This is extremely important, whether you're running on-prem or you're running in another cloud. This enables customers to design their applications based on their exact specifications. Permanent billing, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of workloads in all of your environments that do not need to run on an hour or a daily or a monthly basis. There are going to be workloads that can run for 24 minutes. If you run a workload for 24 minutes on GCP, you only pay for that 24, 24 minutes. We've heard a lot from James about the network, but I want to emphasize what this means from a cloud perspective. We do run the world's largest software-defined network. When you leverage GCP as a customer, you remain on our network. You do not, we do not put you onto the public internet, unlike other providers. And this is important because many of your applications, especially from India, are latency sensitive. We provide global reach. We currently have five global cloud regions. 
We pre-announced our Tokyo region, which will launch later this year, and we've also announced that we're going to be launching another 10 regions by the end of 2017. And that continual investment will not only be from an infrastructure perspective, but our edge locations. We currently have 77 edge locations and more than 100 peering points, which effectively gets us into every major metro on a global basis. And we also provide the ability to scale to over 1 million requests per second for an individual customer. That massive scale is only possible via the network that we've built out. And even with all of these innovations that we've been making on the engineering side, we remain the price performance leader. So many customers see a 50% savings compared to other cloud providers, not just because of our automatic discounts, but because we allow you to pay for only what you need when you need it with the customized virtual machines, with the per minute billing, with the sustained usage discount. We will continue to drive innovation, not only from an engineering perspective, but also from a pricing perspective. Now everyone, everyone, I had three meetings yesterday here and, and actually a dinner meeting as well. Everyone's talking about big data and analytics, everybody. But the reality is, especially on-prem, it's too complex. But at Google, we believe in handling the heavy lifting and creating managed services that allow you, to, and allow you to focus on insights, and we will manage that infrastructure. So we've created an analytics suite of services from Cloud Data Proc, which is a managed Spark and Hadoop cluster in the cloud, to BigQuery, which is our managed enterprise data warehouse, to Cloud Dataflow, which is our managed service for batch and data streaming, to a managed MySQL database in the cloud, to a scalable NoSQL database, which is called Cloud Big Table, to Data Lab, which is an interactive tool to explore, analyze, and visualize data with one click of the button. So no matter what type of big data workload that you're looking to run, you can run it in a managed service on the Google Cloud. And we're also bringing machine learning to the mainstream. And this is extremely important. So there's, here's just a few of the APIs that we've recently come out with. Cloud Translate API, we have a customer in Korea called HyperConnect. They've created an application which allows people to communicate with each other over video chat in different languages. So I can speak in Korea, and it will translate automatically. OK, I can, sorry, let me take a spoke. I can speak in English to someone in Korea. That would be weird if I spoke Korean. Um, it's to someone in Korea, and it will automatically translate to them in Korean, so they understand what I've said in my natural language. They're doing more than 30 million matches per day using Cloud Translate API and Cloud Speech API, an awesome use case. Cloud Vision API, that allows you to look at optical uh, OCR, label detection, image sentiment analysis, or in image sentiment detection, so you can see if you're happy, or if you're sad, or you're angry. I know outside there's doing a demo, and we're going to do a demo for you later today to see what that looks like. Cloud Speech API. So think about here. I know everyone loves Bollywood, OK? So let's say you're a media company. You've created a media recommendation engine. So you talk into your remote control, and you say, find me all content on Rajnikanth. If you can then pull that up via not only your speech, your speech API, but also your image recognition API, what are the possibilities for that? And that's just one potential use case. And then cloud natural language APIs. So there's a lot that you can do and a lot of use cases that you haven't even thought about yet that you could run in the Google Cloud. And as our CEO, Sundar Pichai, has said, machine learning is a core transformative way by which we're rethinking how we're doing everything at Google. So in a quick summary, when you think about Google Cloud, I want you to think about the following. Security. Security at scale is part of Google's DNA. We have over 600 security experts specifically dedicated to cloud within Google. From a networking perspective, we talked about this a lot, but it's important to understand the differentiator that our networking provides. Big data, we are the leading innovator in data. And what's important about that is we were the creators of MapReduce. We've been the creators of Dremel, which has turned into BigQuery. We continue to lead from the front from big data, as well as having a multi-year lead when it comes to machine learning. When you think about openness, really, as James said, every service that we come out with, for the most part, we open source. We share with the community. We want people to be able to use it, whether it's on our platform or on other platforms. And then performance. You know, every GCP service is custom built to run in the cloud. 
So let's take a few moments to talk about customer success stories. I want you to join me in welcoming up on stage Kashalya Nandakumar, who's the CEO of SmartShift, the first entrepreneurial venture funded by the Mahindra Group. Kashalya? Good day, Rick. Hi, everyone. All right, Kashalya, thanks for joining us. So why don't you take a few moments to uh, talk, tell the audience a little bit about SmartShift. So SmartShift is the first incubation from the Mahindra Group. It's a digital mobility platform. So to make it a little simpler, we play in a space of intra-city logistics. About a year back, a group of us kind of got together, and we realized that there is a huge need that's coming up in the small and medium enterprise space. If you look at India, we're a largely scattered country, lots of transporters and small and medium enterprises distributed around the length and breadth of this country. Last count, 50 million SMEs in India. India is also largely dependent on road as a key mode of transport for logistics, for cargo movement. Would you believe 30% of Indian entrepreneurs spend their time only organizing and arranging logistics? 35% of their top line goes in spend for logistics. That's mammoth. And there was a huge gap that was widening in the SMB space. There's a lot of work that's happening with the large enterprises, but not so much with the SMB space. That got us really excited. And we said, this is a space that we want to participate in. To give you an example, I'm actually going to demo the app. Excellent. So I need you guys to walk this story with me. Imagine if you're not a small entrepreneur sitting in your shop and trying to arrange a vehicle. The first question that you have is, how many vehicles are next to me? The first screen on the SmartShift app actually tells you how many vehicles and how close they are to you. Cool, I now get to make a choice that is extremely informed. Then I want to create a trip. In typical SMB parlance, it is, I want to move cargo from where I am to somewhere else. Let's take a popular location. For those of you who are from Mumbai, I'm going to take Andheri. It's a largely populated, very crowded, one of the key reasons for the transport issues that we have. It's 18 kilometers away. That's a data point I never knew. Another unique feature of SmartShift is you can have a complete transparency on this platform. So, Rick, what we've done is you can select your transporter. We will pulse your requirement to as many transporters who fit the bill next to you, and you can select it. Or, you know, if time's important, allow SmartShift to do that heavy lifting for you. Select the time and the date. No haggling anymore with the transporter, abhi a jau, thodi der ke baar a jau. Select the type of vehicle, very cool feature. Select what you're moving. You're moving electronics today, that's pretty cool. Select how you want to pay, and the most innovative feature that we have on our platform. Every entrepreneur anywhere in the world wants control. Logistics is a cost. There is an inherent need to want to control it, so you can bid. You're feeling lucky today. <laughs> I'm going to bid a lower price, and let's see what the transporters say. In a matter of three minutes, the closest transporters who are interested to take your job will revert back with reverse bids. You, the entrepreneur, have a complete selection. You can make the choice. That's what SmartShift does. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So why don't you tell the audience? Yeah, that was great, wasn't it? It's fantastic. So why did you choose to work with GCP? Oh, there are many reasons. So. Um, about a year back when we were sitting together and we were saying what kind of a technology platform would we need, uh, and that was us with our partner Media Agility, uh, a lot of elements came up, a lot of necessary to have, and I'm so happy I was a part of the conference today because it's reinforced our belief multiple times that we made the right choice. The first element was we needed someone who could support us with rapid scale. To just give you an idea, we do on an average a couple of hundreds of transactions every day today, but that's going to touch a million very soon. We needed someone who could deal with that scalability automatically, organically, and inexpensively. We didn't want to spend a huge amount of money on DevOps. SmartShift is now live for nine months. Rick, I don't have a single DevOps engineer on my, on my, in my business. Uh, the, sec the third thing was we wanted robustness. We wanted reliability, and I'm so glad James talked so much more about it. Uh, it's something that we really love about Google because we have confidential data about our customers. We have their complete background with us. And the last and most important was we wanted someone who could partner us in our vision. 
And the vision that we have is we are going to use analytics and data to solve efficiency and productivity problems. And we've already migrated to BigQuery and going to use it extensively to actually mine real-time data and feed it back to our customers. So for all of these reasons and many about, I was thinking about what Rajan said earlier. He said large enterprises actually are going into Google. I'm happy to tell you SmartShift was born into Google. We were born with Google. Yeah? So that was multiple reasons that we selected Smart Google. Awesome. Well, that's a fantastic story. Thank you very much for joining us up on stage. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So here's a broader view of some of our other customers on a global basis that are working with us. So for those that aren't familiar, Snapchat runs everything on the Google Cloud platform. We've been working with Coca-Cola over the past few years on a number of campaigns, marketing, websites, mobile apps. We've been working with HTC, the phone manufacturer out of Taiwan, on a number of their workloads and applications. Here, you guys would be familiar with Jaguar and Land Rover since Tata bought them. We've been working with Jan Jaguar and Land Rover uh, for a number of years on a number of their workloads, and as well as Motorola and many others. What I would encourage you to do if you are currently using Google Cloud and you'd like for us to talk, to about, uh, talk about you, come find me later. We'd love to hear from you. So I hope that you've enjoyed this high-level overview of the Google Cloud platform. I want to leave you with that we're not just thinking about now. We're thinking about and working on what's next. So thank you very much. We look forward to helping you with your journey onto the cloud. So now I'd like to uh, have you hear from an amazing enterprise customer about the ways that they've made their traditional business smart, modern, and secure by embracing Google technology. Please welcome Vijay Sethi to the stage from Hero Motor Corp. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Google Atmosphere India. I know it's time for my session. I'm running a bit late. You know the traffic in Mumbai. I bought this new shiny bike. It was launched in Mumbai only the day for yesterday. I'll be there very soon. Hold on to your seats. See you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I know I was running a bit late, uh, but Google Hangouts, you would have seen it. <laughs> and that's how we use technology. We are the world's largest two-wheeler company. And guess what? We produce a bike every two seconds. So it's not in a few minutes or hours, but every two seconds, one bike comes out of our factories. The factories all over India, a couple of them outside India. And I thought that uh, over the next few minutes, I'll share with you as to what we are doing over here at Hero, how we are using Google, why we went for Google, and some of the other things that we do. The key thing that comes up and uh, we've been seeing in this entire agenda is that 
Is it about digital? Is it about innovation? There are a lot of people who think that innovation and digital are two different things. Digital, you go ahead, put in some social media sites, you go in for cloud, analytics, mobile, and you're done. Innovation perhaps is something different. The reality is, why are you going digital? And that's what all of us need to think of. I do not want to do digital for sake of being digital. The digital has to be done with a purpose. It has to be done with a purpose which meets the business objectives. And each business has its own set of problems, its set of objectives, and innovation is a key thing that's there globally. So if digital is done with innovation in mind, only then digital makes sense. Otherwise, it seems that there are two distinct things and people are kind of working in two different silos. While digital is aimed at ensuring that there are no silos, but there are times when a lot of stuff within the organizations is done without a single objective, it in itself creates silos. And that's what we need to ensure in our own organizations that if you are going digital, it has to be done with a purpose. And the key purpose, as we think, is it's all about uh, innovation. I am a CIO, of course, in the organization. I've been there for many years. But as I see, and that's true for a lot of my colleagues at Hero Motor Corp, that instead of being an IT person or a marketing person or a salesperson, each one of us is a hero innovator. What is hero innovator? It's basically someone who comes from hero family. And the key objective over there, or the key role that each one of us plays in our organization is how can we innovate or how can we help the organization's other employees innovate. So that's what the key role that I'm playing and many of my colleagues in the organization are playing that how can we be hero innovators. Two things, I'm coming back to now hero perspective. There are two things that at least I focus on, some of my colleagues focus on. And one of them is innovation, as I said. The, why we want to focus on innovation? If you really read this uh, thing on the left, I think in our organization, each one of us generally believes in this statement that whatever we did, even last month, last year, it will not take us to 2019, 2020. That's where we need to innovate constantly. We have been world's largest two-wheeler company for the last 15 years. Just because we have been world's largest two-wheeler company since 2001, it doesn't mean that whatever steps we took over the last 15 years will ensure that we'll continue to be world's largest two-wheeler company. We need to innovate. And who does this innovation? It's done by employees. So while we produce uh, these almost 7 million bikes every year, but if you would have seen some of our ads over last few years and uh, even the factories that we have opened, the key tagline that now we are saying is that we are manufacturing happiness. Two wheelers is a byproduct, but we want to manufacture happiness. Happiness for whom? Happiness for our customers, happiness for our stakeholders, vendors, and of course our employees. And that's where Google does fit into our scheme of things. Where does Google fit in? See, at the end of the day, who, I, who is working within the organization to make it happy? It's our employees. And what, what does one do? Employees need to be creative. I need to give an environment to them so that they can always come up with something. Different. That's where the signs of real innovation within our organization as we think. The first is, it's about ensuring that your en environment in which the employees work, that has to be very engaging. If the en environment is cons uh, very constrictive, uh, very restrictive, you really cannot be innovative. So that's the first thing that we are trying to do, that your environment has to be very, very engaging. The second thing is, if the employees are innovative, what are they trying to do? That comes back to the very first point that I said, that each one of them has to work on creating some value. The end result is, are you creating value on a daily basis? When I go back home in the evening, can I say that I have created some bit of value for my organization? And of course, there's always, especially in a two-wheeler or an automotive company, there's always this thing that you need to be cost competitive, you need to ensure that your efficiencies increase on a daily basis, your operational efficiencies, as I said, we produce a bike in two seconds. If we make it 1.9 seconds, suddenly our production capacities go up. So one needs to focus on operational efficiencies on a daily basis, every, every moment basis. And that's where Google also plays a key role. We have uh, four factories in India. We have a factory in Latin America. A factory in Bangladesh is coming up. We have roughly around 7,300 staff members. There are thousands of workers and other associates who work with us at Hero. 
And of course, we have 6,000 touch points. What are these touch points? These are the places where a customer comes in. These are dealers, service points, and others. And we want to ensure that each of these points and each of our employees is today working in an environment which is happy environment, where they can really create that value what we are looking for. And what does this happiness mean? Happiness is, in simple words, meaning that I'm not frustrated. In very plain and simple, that I feel what I'm doing is good. It's, if I look at the way of working that we used to work before we went in for Google, that was around one and a half years back, a very simple thing. You're working on an email environment. You want to send an attachment, which is maybe a 10 MB or a 12 MB. Then you want to send a few other mails. And what are you doing? You're twiddling your thumbs. Because the, till the first mail goes, you can't really send the other mails. Till this mail gets downloaded, you can't do anything. And that's what creates frustration. Even if I save one minute per day, 20 minutes per month for one, one employee, I think it really helps a lot. So that's one. The second is finding that document, version one, two, three, four. And you really don't know. You're, you go into a meeting and you don't know which document you're talking about. Someone refers to a particular document. Other one says that, let me spend next few minutes in searching my mails and see as to which document are you referring to. And while many of the companies over years put in something called an ERP to get that single version of truth, but the reality is what has happened over years most of the conversation is not about structured data. It's about what happens on your email, what happens on your other systems. And perhaps there's a time when ERP systems used to be the most critical systems in the organization. Today, many of these systems are the most critical systems. You can live without ERP for a few minutes, but you can't live without any of these collaboration systems even for one minute. And that's, if those systems can give you a single version of truth, I think that's where the organization's abilities come. And if you work in a collaborative environment, if all of us are working on a single uh, document, that will give us that single version of truth that each one of us is looking for. And when you're sitting in a meeting or you're talking or you're working in a global environment, we operate out of 34 odd countries. So when you're working on some of these global teams and you get that single version of truth, and that's where the happiness for the people come in. And of course, from a pure, pure technology guys, uh, uh, happiness also comes that you don't have all those servers to maintain, all those backups to be taken, and all other stuff, because every other time there would be some call that somebody's client is not working, and all those things. All those things are gone moment you get into this. So once you are that, once you are in an environment where, where you're not really focusing on the core or the back end of technology, what are you doing? You are spending your time, your creative energies into thinking about other stuff. That's where you're happy, and that's once the entire environment is happy, once the entire environment is engaging, people really work very well. And coming back to the earlier point that I said that why we went for Google, I think the key thing was, one, of course, it gives all the operational benefits, but more importantly, in our journey to become a good innovative company, in our journey to ensure that our employees, our stakeholders are happy, that's where Google played a key role. Now, if you look at this, I'll just give you one simple example on uh, a very innovative or a very different thing that at least I do in uh, my own IT organization. So every four months, so that's twice, uh, three times a year, we run something called a special project. A special project is what people are just, so they have four members of IT team, four into three, so they have, there are three projects running, so 12 people, they are taken out of their regular jobs. They are asked to work on something very different, which is not related to their work. So they will pick up a topic, maybe very, very different. Uh, there are some people who are, for example, today working on augmented reality and other stuff. So they are asked to work on something which they have not even looked at. So there's this team of uh, our engineers, the four uh, IT people, who came back and said that once we migrated to Google Apps, they said they want to just work on uh, Chromebook. Now, as a company, we had never worked on Chromebook. We were used to the regular laptops uh, and PCs. But now, so we bought those Chromebooks, we gave it to them, they explored it for a few months. What has happened today? Most of these guys who actually worked and many others, they really don't want to shift back to laptops. They say that this is now, it's kind of addictive. And they are working on these Chromebooks on a daily basis and that's what it has held us. And when we ask them that, 
Once you move from a regular way of working to a Chromebook kind of environment, what kind of training do you need? Almost zero. No one wants. They say, let's explore. And within one day, these guys are kind of pros on uh, using a Chromebook. That's how people work. Now, when we migrated to Google, and this is a very interesting uh, anecdote that I wanted to share with you. So it was somewhere in uh, October or September 2014, and uh, some of our partners who held us are here. So there's this meeting that happens, and as I just asked as to how many days does it take to migrate. And we have around 6,000 odd employees. As told, it takes around six months because you have to migrate the data, it does that. And the key thing which I said during the meeting, I said first January is around 45, 46 days uh, ahead. So we are somewhere around uh, 15th November. So it was a kickoff day for that particular project. So can we go live on first January? And the standard response which came, number one, not possible. The second thing is, the first guys, the first set of guys who will go live will face a lot of problems. And I said, okay, let me be the first guy. So instead of first set of guys, I'll be the, your first guy who will be there. And first January, we went live on actually 31st December. 44 days flat, the entire thing was done. And I'm really thankful to my partners and to Google team, which really held us in ensuring that 44 days, with all the data, the entire organization went live. And one of the key things that, when, they, when we were reviewing the project plan, they said that, what could be the components of this project plan which could be compressed? And I said, if you are talking about a smart, modern, secure kind of system where we are moving, and it's modern, and kids even of the age of four or five or six are using this kind of thing, why do I need a, even one minute's training for my entire team, the entire employees? So the training component preparation of the entire thing was made to zero. So for our Google stuff, we actually had a zero minutes of training. And finally, in 44 days, we could actually achieve, and I'm really happy that we could do that uh, over there, which means that our teams, the teams which really were kind of not too happy working with some of the other stuff that they were doing earlier because of all the frustrations, now could spend a lot of time, a lot of energy in kind of innovating and creating more value for the organization. Because employees do not want to waste time today, in today's time on those things which they find is non value add number one. Number two, as we were progressing on Google, one thing that we did was a very regular communication right from day one. And all the employees were included in that. So as we progressed during those 44 days, employees, kind of everyone was ready that, OK, yes, we are going in for Google in a few days. And everyone felt a part of in this journey of Google. It has held us in driving innovation across the organization, given us a lot of flexibility, because now you can do a lot of stuff which was not possible earlier. Collaboration is one of the biggest things. Working on one single uh, document is another. In many of the projects, it has held us where the project plans are now kind of central project plans, which is work helping us in reducing our times from that. And of course, it has actually, if I was to just summarize in one line what how Google has held us, it has held us in changing the culture of the organization. So instead of a 31-year-old organization, which is kind of legacy organization, now we say that we are more of a more modern organization than many of the organizations which could be even less in age from 31 years from us. And that's where it has really held us. Chromebook has become kind of uh, standard. So there are a lot of people who use Chromebook in a big way. And that's what is helping us out. People are really, really happy. And when people are happy, that's where it helps the organization. Now, this is a very nice quote by the Dalai Lama, which says that happiness is something which cannot be made. You have to really ensure that you work towards it. From our perspective, we at Hero Motor Corp really work to ensure that during those 45 days and post of that, we work with Google Teams to ensure that we are really, our teams are happy. And I'll just give one example on how that we can say that our teams are happy. So we actually, if you look at, I, I joined Hero Motor Corp in 2007. Since that day, till 2016 today, I, when I inherited a team size of, at that time, around 35 odd people, which was our IT team, today it's around 100 odd people on roles, zero attrition. In IT teams, it's, and in IT environment, it's really difficult to ensure that you get a zero attrition. Not even a single person since 2007, the team that I inherited at that time has left as of now. And 
And one of the key reasons, it's actually difficult to ensure that people are retained and we need to ensure that the environment is very kind of engaging and happy and that's where Google has played a huge role over the last two years because all the new guys who are coming in, they do not want to get into an email system or a collaborative system which is kind of outdated, which they are not used to. So I'm happy. So is my boss, uh, Mr. Munjal, who is very happy with this. And why we are happy is very simple that this Google migration has held us becoming smarter. We can actually get many of the people who, whom we interact during uh, interview time, they first ask as to what kind of system you use. And when we say that we are using a lot of cloud and Google Mail, it really helps. It's modern, of course, we have heard that. Everything is there on the mobile. You can do all the Hangouts, Google Drive, other stuff. And of course, security, we just saw that it's one of the most secure systems. Uh, that, and that's what's making uh, all of us uh, really happy in the organization. I would like to take this opportunity to thank, compliment uh, Google team and the partners who held us in ensuring that we as an organization have really gained a lot from uh, this entire thing. Thank you very much. Before I end, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, one, on behalf of uh, my entire team and uh, all my users, I want to say a formal thanks to Google team and my partners for giving us uh, kind of this smart, secure, uh, and modern environment. And one of these guys whom I was uh, talking to when I told him that uh, I was going in for this uh, atmosphere, he said that, from my side, please convey it to the Google One line. He said, since you're going into Mumbai and it's more of a Bollywood city, so from that line, just say that. Just say this to the entire Google team that, Google, we love you a lot. Thank you, Google. <laughs> Let me invite uh, Taru Daya onto stage uh, for the last session. Taru, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vijay. Wow. Great customers, partners, and solutions for the modern enterprise. We hope you understand how committed Google is to India and to the enterprise. We really, really appreciate your time. We really appreciate you making time to come to this event. You heard from Rajan about a lot of um, investment in India around Android One. You heard about 2 million developers, Android developers in India. He, talk, he talked about a lot of campaigns with respect to getting women, helping women get online. That's a commitment to India that we're already showcasing. We want to partner with all of you. We want to partner with all the businesses, big, small, traditional, modern. Help them embrace the modern tools for your modern workforce. My name is Taru Dahiya, and I'll be briefly recapping what you heard, what you saw, and most likely took notes of from this morning. We want to, if you look at, you know, the solutions, today's population that exist within your organization, the kind of tools that they need, the kind of environment they breathe in, is all about modern, smart, secure technology. It's really critical for businesses like yours to adopt the technology, to connect with that audience, to compete locally and globally, accelerate your growth, and secure your future. So let me just share quickly the three components that we talked about, smart, modern, and secure. Smart, it's our heritage, is making the mundane easier by making that information accessible for all, be it the customers, be it the partners, be it the enterprise. By leveraging the smart algorithms, by making use of the human insights and the compute engine. We really want to make sure that you all are securing your future as businesses. The population today, a lot of your employees are using these Technology, this technology, they're leveraging the smart products, and it's increasingly becoming more familiar with smartphones, smart cars. You talk about, you know, um, smart solutions that Internet of Things of the world is offering. Bill talked about machine learning, how it's really set to revolutionize the world, 
the in all the industries across the board. Modern, it's all about smashing silos, it's bringing people together. It's accelerating the sharing so that no ideas, big or small, relevant, irrelevant, are left behind in the margins. There was a very powerful phrase this morning that was around 10 seconds, you know, are saved when collaboration meets smart applications. Just imagine yourself, all you businesses out there, imagine yourself to be in a situation where you have thousands of employees and you're saving 10 seconds again and again here and there. When those 10 seconds are multiplied by thousands of employees, it really brings a meaningful and a significant impact, not just for your employees, but for you as a business. What that really means for your business is productivity gains, efficiency gains, and in turn, reduction of cost. But for your employees, we heard a lot about this in the morning. It increases the happiness quotient. It really helps you retain the talent. Mr. Vijay talked about how there has been no turnover since 2007. But if you look at what really that means for you, you can retain that top talent, you can increase efficiency, you can increase the productivity within your business. Secure. Rajan talked about, Mohit touched upon this. We were born in the cloud. But security built at its core. Google's network is so large that not only it connects every data center to each other, but it actually connects nearly every ISP in the world. The most secure infrastructure technology platform out there. PwC, Mr. Dipankar talked about how, you know, the number one, world's number one professional services firm talked about how they trust and believe in the statement. With products and solutions like two-factor authentication, end-to-end -end encryption, and with huge focus on ensuring that we're leading the enterprise from a compliance standpoint, we are building solutions that not only secure our customers, your customers, but at the same time, it's building the confidence in the cloud. With that, smart, modern, secure that you've been hearing since morning, just want to make sure that you understand that it's not just a catchy line. It actually means something to you. What it really means that we would like you to take this Google's incredible power and reach to take your business and take India to the next level. We've heard a lot about smart, modern, secure. You saw a lot of slides out there. You heard speakers talk about a lot of this. But what really this means for you, that smart, modern, secure technology is out there. Google has that vehicle. Your employees have begun the journey. And we invite you to take the driver's seat and own the future of your business. Over the next 45 odd minutes, we'll break for lunch, but I really want to briefly recap what we have planned for you in the second half. We have one of my inspiring colleagues, Sapna Chadha, marketing head for Google India, come on stage and talk a lot about the programs, businesses, products that we're making accessible to Indian audience. Followed by a lot of immersive demo sessions across Google Apps, Maps, Cloud, devices, and um, you'll have the first-hand experience that the users experience as well. And post that, you are either during lunch or if you get time in the afternoon, we have a partner village on eighth floor where you can actually go and meet the partners that we talked about since morning, and you can actually look at the products and experience the products firsthand. So I'm coming in between you and lunch right now. So I really want to offer the break um, for lunch. We will be back by 1.30, and uh, lunch will be served on the ninth floor as well as on the eighth floor. We hope to see you back for an afternoon full of emotion. Thank you. It's a blow. 124.2. Huh? 120.